everyone, you're watching the Asian American Herald, a new media network featuring the Asian Americans in the capital region of New York. You can also watch a recording of this show and all of our previous episodes from our Facebook page, Asian American Herald of the Capital District. My name is Shruti Natanmai, and I'm a student at the Fashion Institute of Technology, writer and creative who was born and raised in the capital region. Tonight, I'm super excited to speak with Jeremy Cooney, the Democratic New York State Senate candidate for Rochester, which is also a District 56. Jeremy, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Of course, it is my pleasure. So I'd like to start by asking you to take a minute to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about uh, your background. Like, where did you grow up? What are some of your interests? Sure, glad to. And hello to all of your viewers. Um, I will say that my background is a little bit different than the traditional political candidate. Um, I like to classify it as an Indian American story. So. I actually was born in an orphanage in Calcutta, India, and was adopted at a very young age um, to come to upstate New York, of all places, um, through the grace of God and through the courageousness of a, of a single mom. Uh, my mom adopted me, and I was actually one of the first uh, Indian males to ever come be adopted and come to New York. So um, kind of breaking down barriers um, in a time when, when Indian babies who were male weren't necessarily allowed um, to leave the country. Um, so pretty excited to um, obviously have had the opportunity to come to America, come to Rochester and upstate New York. Um, I grew up in Rochester. I went through city schools, K through 12, um, great public schools. My mom um, was a teacher at Monroe Community College, which is part of the SUNY system. Uh, so education obviously is something that's really important to me. And uh, I just had the opportunity to just work hard and get college uh, scholarships and then law school scholarships. Uh, I was in the capital region for a number of years. I was at Albany Law School um, and had a great experience there. And of course, um, you know, had the opportunity to be in a different variety of different positions. Uh, but it, you know, there comes a point in your life where you want to give back to the community that helped raise you. And that is why I undertook this role to run for the New York State Senate and hopefully have the opportunity to uh, work and advocate on behalf of my neighbors in Rochester. Sure, that's such an amazing story too. Yeah. Um, what Do you remember anything of what that change was like coming from Calcutta to upstate New York? <laughs> Very similar, very similar. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine. <laughs> well, we're, we're, you know, we're pretty fortunate to have a, a, a pretty significant for outside of New York City, that is, um, Indian community, South Asian community in, in greater Rochester, mostly because of the economics of our region being a healthcare center and education center, and obviously um, legacy corporations like Kodak and Xerox, which hired a lot of uh, engineers uh, from India. So we have a pretty robust Indian community. Um, my, you know, my I came over when I was so young um, that I don't obviously have too many memories of my time in the orphanage, uh, but I can tell you that I've had the opportunity to go back um, uh, with my with my mom to visit uh, India and uh, to that orphanage, which is called International Mission of Hope in in Calcutta. Uh, unfortunately, um, it closed down almost 20 years ago when I was in college. Um, so I'm so grateful I had the opportunity to go back and to see the wonderful aunties and nurses who are there uh, or were there. And of course my photo was on the wall. It's like a kid who made it out, which is always a surreal, <laughs> you know, experience yeah. to see a baby photo of yours in a foreign country. Um, but it was a, it was a really um, uh, just a blessing to be able to come to to this country, and um, you know, and who and who am I, right? I'm very, I'm very cognizant and very humble of the fact that you know, but for again that that single mom saying I want to adopt a kid from India, from around the world, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I would not probably, let's be honest, um, you know, maybe be on this earth at this point, right? And certainly not have the opportunity to to have a, attain the education that I have. And to now be seeking a service uh, or seeking an office in public service, so um, uh, it's a very uh, meaningful uh, campaign for me. For sure, that's incredible. That's so. I know you touched on this very briefly, but did you have a clear kind of clear idea of the career path that 
you wanted to pursue from a young age or did you kind of piece it together along the way? Well, I, I, you know, I, I always joke, right? I, I'm an adopted Indian boy, but um, I certainly had some of those same intrinsic values. So like many Asians or South Asians, I had a strong desire to go into a scientific and healthcare career field, right? So I was pre-med. I was, uh, um, you know, really excited about uh, having a career as a pediatrician. Uh, and so yeah. <laughs> that's not the case. Um, and I, I always say that that career and that dream stopped at organic chemistry for me. <laughs> there are a lot of smart, smarter people uh, <laughs> yeah. out there. <laughs> Um, but what I did do is, I, so I went to school in upstate New York. I went to Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva. Okay. And, you know, the, the great thing is that I was, I was able to um, translate in a liberal arts education setting those uh, natural science courses to doing healthcare policy. And so I really focused hard on bridging that gap between my bi biological studies and public policy studies. Um, and that's really kind of what turned me on to the political spectrum, truthfully, because it was a, I was a junior, um, wow, way back when, a junior in 2002, um, had the opportunity to work for Congresswoman Louise Slaughter uh, down on Capitol Hill in Washington. She is our late Congresswoman here in the greater Rochester area, served for many, many years of distinction as a Democrat in the House of Representatives. And I had the chance to be her intern. And then fortunately, after graduating from college, she, she hired me on as her staff. So it was my first job right out of college. And that, you know, she inspired me uh, to go on to a career of giving back to others and helping others. And uh, that's what really just led me, you know, all these many years later uh, to take the plunge and to jump, uh, jump into the campaign and political world. For sure. That's, yeah, that's amazing. So did you, when was it in that journey that you kind of decided that you wanted to go to law school? You know, I, I was never really, um, you know, gung ho about law school. I remember a lot of my friends um, from college were graduating and taking the LSAT exam, the entrance exam for law school. And I said, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a law and order guy. You know, that's just not my thing. I, I liked the TV show, but I didn't want to spend my career in a, in a, in a courtroom. Uh, of course, that's not really how law school works. I didn't know that at the time. Um, but it, you know, I, I had a chance to take a couple of jobs, including that job from Congresswoman Slaughter after graduating from college. And uh, after that, I uh, realized I got to a point in my career where I wanted to take that next step. And part of law school, it, it's very much a trade school, right? You learn how to read and to write in a very different way. And I, I always uh, prided myself on being a strong communicator and a writer. I think probably that some of that came from my mom being an English professor. Uh, but you know that experience to kind of go back to school, look at issues, critical, complex issues in a very different way and write about it and break it down in a, in a logical form, that was what law school was about for me. So that's why I went to law school was to become a better writer and a better communicator. Uh, and I'm grateful I had that experience. I think I always think that um, my writing has improved, but it's a journey that you always keep on working on. I'm a, I'm a big reader, so I continue to to read and to write and to learn. And I think that's what will hopefully make me a stronger legislator is to have that legal background um, when considering uh, issues of public policy. Sure. Yeah. So what was your work as an attorney focused on? So I work mostly um, in the litigation side, right? So I work for a small uh, litigation law firm in, in downtown Rochester, uh, a great firm that did a lot of work for medical malpractice defense work. Um, they worked with our local hospitals and institu healthcare institutions. Um, you know, University of Rochester Medical Center, for example, is the largest employer um, in, in Rochester and upstate New York, actually. And so, um, you know, having the opportunity to work with physicians and work with uh, senior attorneys to learn about how uh, healthcare is delivered and how do we keep patients safe and how do we keep hospitals uh, operating efficiently, that was a great experience. And then I translated that really to the nonprofit world uh, because for three, just a little over three years, I served as the vice president at the YMCA of Greater Rochester. Uh, and in that role, I was doing, a, a, you know, more than just, you know, type of legal work, right? It was 
uh, fundraising, it was board relations, it was a little bit of uh, government relations, right? So it was really an exposure to a complex not-for-profit organization like the Y. Um, and then I got myself back into the political the political world. So, uh, but th those experiences really helped shape my view of how government can be better at providing services and operating in a more efficient way so that we are good stewards, not only of taxpayer dollars, but of understanding customer service and how we are interacting with the citizens that we are hopefully representing. Yeah. Would you say that after attending law school and those experiences and kind of getting gaining that better understanding that inspired you to run for um, the New York Sen State Senate? You know, I think I think everything kind of comes together. Right. I, I always say that the path that I am on now has all built upon each other. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was a legislative aide early on. Right. And then I had the chance to work and as an attorney and, and then a nonprofit executive and then got back into local government, right? I served as the chief of staff to the mayor of Rochester, uh, Mayor Lovely Warren for again, just about three years. And um, you know, all of those experiences helped shape my view of the world, just like we all do, right? In our, in our lives. These are what opened my mind to how we could do things better. Um, so, and actually, to go back to one of your earlier questions about um, science and healthcare, um, unfortunately, that that brave and courageous uh, single mom who adopted me from India uh, went through a health uh, tragedy in her life. She uh, was diagnosed with early onset dementia and uh, later died from an aggressive brain tumor. Um, but I, as her only child, she never married and I was her only child. So I obviously was involved in her, her end of life healthcare decision making. And I just, it was so complex. It was so awful. And uh, that I just kept on thinking, gosh, there has got to be a better way to make sure that we deliver quality and affordable healthcare to every New Yorker, especially uh, considering that uh, many of our older adults, our senior citizens, don't have the resources that they may have had in their working years when they're on a fixed income, right? And so prescription drug costs are out of control. All, the copay costs to go see providers is out of control. Insurance premium costs are skyrocketing. We can do better. And so that's why I got into this race, is to help make healthcare more affordable for families in New York. Definitely. Definitely. And I think that's also especially important right now, um, considering this pandemic and how there are many people who need access to health care. Yeah, that's yeah, that I, I agree with you completely. I mean, COVID-19, what that has done is it's exposed what we already knew, which is that there are health inequities based on one's racial demographic, based on one's age, based on one's income. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example, right, right in Rochester, one's zip code will determine one's life expectancy. Now Rochester, is just like the capital region, Rochester's not that big, right? <laughs> you know, so we're about, you know, a little over 700,000 people when you include our, our suburban towns. And, you know, to, to be able to say that it takes 30 minutes to go from one side of Monroe County to the next, but one's life can change based on where you live, and we know why. It's because of access to health care. It's about underlying health causes like diabetes or exposure to lead paint for children uh, or chronic asthma. These are all things that have exasperated the negative effects of COVID-19 and the coronavirus. So it's no wonder why we see older individuals or low-income individuals with pre-existing health conditions really taking uh, the brunt uh, and the hard um, hard outcomes led from the coronavirus. So uh, that's what we're trying to make more fair, right? That's what I want to make sure that we're doing everything possible, that no matter where you live, whether in Rochester or Albany or New York City, uh, and whatever your income may be, you still have access to great health care. 
and that you are not at more risk because you don't have A, B, or C than someone else. We've got to equalize this playing field because I believe healthcare is a right and I want to make sure everyone has access to that quality and affordable care. Yeah, and that's incredibly important. So I applaud you for taking that on. That <laughs> well, it's a, big, it's a big task, and yes. uh, and we have a lot of friends in Albany who have been uh, working on it for a long time. But again, I think what we're seeing is, and this is not just about my race here in Rochester, but really across New York State, we are seeing a generational change happen. We are seeing longtime state assembly people and senators retiring. We are seeing new faces, new uh, people who look different than our current state legislative caucuses. We are seeing uh, younger people. We are seeing people with different backgrounds, not necessarily all lawyers. Look at, look at our, our friends down in New York City. We elected some public school teachers. Uh, we elected community activists, right? These are different perspectives, different lenses that we look through when creating laws in New York. And so that's really exciting um, for me as a New Yorker, right? To think about how we are growing and we are changing. Um, and you know, I wanna be part of that. I wanna have the opportunity to, to add my voice uh, a lot on behalf of the people of Rochester to say, we wanna change in our healthcare system. It's not currently working. How can we do things better? Um, I, I don't know about you, but I, I feel very frustrated that a lot of people say they want change. Everyone says, oh, we want to change things, but no one wants to go through the process of doing that change because it's hard and it's scary because we don't know what it looks like. But what we do know, what we do know now is that healthcare is not working for the majority of New Yorkers and that we have to do something different. And uh, I'm committed to being part of that solution finding process. Yeah, and I yeah I think doing something different is incredibly important because as you said, this pandemic really exposed not just our healthcare system, but a lot of other systems that we have yeah, in place true. and how they are not necessarily the best for those who don't already have access to resources. Um, so that's a big task, but definitely <laughs> achievable. And I thank you for taking that on. Well, we'll talk in two years and well, hopefully before that. But, you know, the way, I think the healthcare conversation can no longer be pushed down the road. Definitely. Again, I think COVID, again, really pushed us to say this system is broken. So yep. what are you, Albany lawmaker, whether you're from way up in, in the North Country or way down the Southern Tier, what are you going to do? to make things better. Yeah, and I think it's important to ask those questions and hold yeah. people accountable for following through with making change in these yeah. towns. Yeah, so that's great, it's great. So um, do you feel that your law background and attending law school has helped you thus far in constructing your uh, successful campaign and kind of working in the political scene? I think it's given me a, a realistic framework to start from, right? I, okay. You know, I know I've read obviously in my legal training and then in my in my short practice uh, a lot about how we execute on laws, how laws are enforced, how we maintain justice, how we are creating uh, new types of policies and regulations, right? And at the state level of government. A lot of the work, other than budget work, is, is, is centered around those regulations, whether we're talking about criminal justice reform, whether we're talking about education policy or health standards, which we've heard a lot about, obviously, with the reopening of schools recently. You know, all of these um, issues and matters are at the state regulatory level. So I think my background as a lawyer allows me to understand how that process uh, should work at least, and uh, how we can be more thoughtful in creating legislation that is more comprehensive in nature. Um, the worst thing that we could do as a lawmaker is to rush to a solution and then have incomplete or unclear type of policies or regulations which cause a lot of confusion 
and cause maybe a small business to spend a lot of money in trying to navigate a process which is very confusing and, um, and perhaps unnecessary. That's not good for our customers, right? Or our, the citizens that we're looking to represent. We need to be very intentional and know that every decision that we make in the state legislature has a real impact on people. And I think sometimes that gets forgotten, especially from uh, folks who have been in the Albany bureaucracy for many, many years. I mean, God bless them for their public service. Uh, but again, I think we've lost touch a little bit with how the laws that are being made in Albany impact uh, not only our economy with small businesses, like I mentioned before, but real human beings, real families who are trying to navigate this really strange and uneasy time post coronavirus. How do we get back to work? How do I get my kid to feel safe in a school setting? How do I um, uh, get extended unemployment benefits, right? These are the things that are on people's mind. It keeps them up late at night. And we need to be listening to the, to the people that we hope to represent uh, so that we are better public servants for their needs. Definitely, and there's certainly a lot of uncertainty right now, as you said, so that's, yeah, that's very important. So, um, and so speaking about your campaign, I noticed the word onward <laughs> used often on your website. And so I just wanted to ask you if you could kind of expand upon the significance of that word and how it represents you or your beliefs. Absolutely. So um, when we were first starting this campaign, now we started to run for this seat in the 56th Senate District in 2018. So it's been about two and a half years. Now we, we ran against uh, the incumbent senator in 2018. We came up short. Uh, we got 44% of the vote and uh, you know we learned a lot from that process, but we never stopped showing up. We never stopped our campaign because we knew we had to win this seat to bring new leadership to the greater Rochester area and a voice in the new democratic majority. So uh, we use the word onward as kind of our catchphrase or our, our, our slogan, right? Which is, it symbolizes moving forward. What's next for upstate New York? What's next for Rochester? And, you know, really looking, not being nostalgic about our past, but really being forward thinking about what is the country, or I'm sorry, the, the state and the community that we want to create? Uh, I believe uh, as an upstater, as a Rochesterian, that we need to look differently at our economy and the things that we are investing in at the state level and how to create new jobs for hardworking families in the greater Rochester area. I also believe, we talked about healthcare for sure, but education is changing before our eyes. And I'm proud to have the endorsement of the New York State teachers. I'm proud uh, to have a lot of support from our friends, both in higher education uh, and in secondary education. Uh, but I believe that the way we educate students in our urban and suburban school systems maybe needs to be updated uh, because we know that we're not necessarily educating and training the workforce for those jobs of tomorrow, for the global economy that is now the reality for every American child. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a product of the Rochester City School District. It is the worst performing school district, public school district in the state of New York. We graduate the least amount of African-American males in the state of New York. That's a problem. And, you know, I'm very proud to be a public school graduate, but uh, as I am transitioning in my life, uh, my partner, Diane and I, we wanna start a family. We are both uh, products of public schools. We want to send our kids to great public schools. So this is personal to me. We have to make our schools stronger. And I believe as a state legislator, these are things that we can invest in. But we can't just say, well, we've always done X, Y, or Z. We need to look, we need to move onward, right? We need to look forward and to think, hmm, well, those manufacturing jobs that used to be in upstate New York seem to be starting to go away. How can we train our next generation on software, software development, gaming technologies, optics and photonics? These are the technologies that are creating jobs right in our region. How can we do that more of that? Um, you know, in the capital region, um, they've, done very, they've been very successful 
uh, with investing in technology and you know making sure that there are uh, new jobs created all up and down the north way there's new types of industries that are coming into the capital region so you know as that type of energy spreads across the rest of upstate new york uh, we want to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind and so onward for me personally symbolizes a momentum of moving forward and being open to new ideas in how we deliver services to the people that we hope to represent. That's that's amazing. That's yeah. That's a, that's a, <laughs> um, so looking forward. Um, what goals or aspirations do you have for yourself as a Senate candidate and for Rochester in general, in addition to the education system? And kind of what do you hope to accomplish, or what projects do you hope to take on? So um, in, we talked about the coronavirus a little earlier, mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the practical reality is if we have the opportunity to represent the people of Rochester in the 56th Senate District in uh, the state Senate next year in 2021, a lot of our work is gonna be focused on rebuilding our economy post COVID. Um, we know that there are many, you know, there's many restaurants and, and amenities that have closed or temporary, uh, temporarily closed um, but there are a lot of changing working conditions. There are a lot of people who are struggling. Um, the, our friends in Washington uh, are at a stalemate, right? The, the, the $600 extra that have been, we've been helping to support families uh, is now no longer, right? People have um, had to stay on their rent payments, uh, but that deadline for paying rent is coming up. I'm very worried about uh, a large number of evictions that, that could be happening. So we need to help uh, working families get back on their feet. And that's what my focus is gonna be on is what are those jobs that we can create in Rochester to get people back to work so that they can support their families, that they can focus on growing a family or investing in the community, right? We want people to, mm -hmm. to buy a home, to invest in a home, to help support small businesses, um, to you know, get to know their neighbors. You know, everything I, I'm going to focus on in the state Senate will, will revolve around one simple question. Is it easier to have a family in New York if I do X, Y, or Z? If the answer is no, meaning an education policy or a job uh, training program or a health regulation, if the answer is no, then I'm going to have to really think hard about voting for it because I want to make sure that every New Yorker has the opportunity to start a family, to grow a family, and live a vibrant and fulfilling life, and however they define that, in New York. That's the great promise. Again, to kind of go back to where we started from, you know, I came to this country with nothing. And, you know, through the grace of God and through hard work, we were able to have a campaign that is now on the cusp of winning and to bring real meaningful change on behalf of our neighbors in Rochester and all across New York. Because remember, there are 63 senators in New York. We all have jurisdiction across the state on issues, whether it's down near you at FIT or whether it's up in Lake Placid, right? We, we are focused on creating a stronger state, a stronger New York. And so uh, we are looking to bring that energy. Uh, we are looking to have an open mind uh, but my focus will always be about representing the people of Rochester. That is why I'm running for office. I, I love my hometown. I care about the people. I believe in its future. I'm very positive about upstate New York. I just know that we need new leadership to get things done. And we're committed to doing that work. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So I have one final question. For okay. Okay that surrounds uh, Asian American involvement in politics more generally. So in upstate New York, uh, Asian Americans kind of continue to be minority, especially in, a, in the political atmosphere. So what advice do you have for Asian Americans looking to either run for elected office or just be more involved in their communities? Well, I agree. Um, I believe that our state legislature should reflect the diversity of our state. I think diversity makes us a stronger New York. And uh, we have a large number of Asian Americans, um, both downstate and upstate, as we talked about before. 
And so I would just encourage folks to run. Don't wait for your turn. Get involved at your local uh, Democratic or Republican or whatever party you identify as their committee level. Step up, volunteer on a campaign, get to know the, the, the people in your community, talk to your neighbors. Um, find out what's on their minds. And if you have something that you want to contribute, if you have a new idea, if you have an experience or a story that's been frustrating that you want to change, then throw your name in the hat. Um, you know, the first step to running for office is believing in yourself and believing in the community that you're hoping to represent. If you believe in yourself and you believe you have something to contribute, then don't let anyone stop you from running for office. There has never been an Asian American to win state elected office from upstate New York. We're going to change that in November, right? And no one would have thought that the person changing that came from an orphanage in Calcutta. But that's the American story. That's the New York story. And so um, I, I just I want to help and and reach down and reach up to help people to either get me to a bigger place or to help others come to a place that they're comfortable with. It's about reaching back and remembering our roots. Uh, I am very bullish on giving opportunities to people who feel that they are shut out of a political process. And I would encourage any of your um, subscribers and listeners uh, to visit our website, jeremycooney.com. My email address is right on there. Contact me directly. And if we can help and you in some way or connect the dots to someone, we will. We want to see a more diverse state legislature. We want to see that state legislature reflect the diversity of New York. And that includes Asian Americans. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much. You're Thanks welcome. For joining us today, and I wish you all the best the rest of your campaign. Um, to everyone watching, thank you for joining us this evening on the Asian American Herald. I'm Shruthi Natanmai, and our wonderful guest for today was Jeremy Cooney. The Asian American Herald is a Facebook-based news media network dedicated to discussing topics and building community amongst Asian Americans in the capital region. Please send us any story ideas and look for the recording of this show on our Facebook page. Have a good evening and thank you again.